All right, we're back for another media law chat. This one um, focusing on Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District. So I'm very excited to welcome my friend Frank today to talk with us about this key case. Frank, why don't you introduce yourself, who you are, where you're from? Hi, thanks. Yeah, I'm Frank Lamonti. I teach media law down at the University of Florida, and I run a uh, research center, the uh, Breckner Center for Freedom of Information. Um, my infatuation with Tinker goes back to my days running the Student Press Law Center uh, nonprofit legal aid organization up in D.C. Yeah, so in these chats, I've asked everybody to identify a top case, and some, in some, for some people, that's been a favorite case. I suspect that's uh, the situation for you. For others, it's the case that they really would have liked to have seen go differently. Uh, so let's uh, let's dig in a bit on Tinker. Um, what makes this case special? Why why is it one of your top cases? So I think it's an important case both for what it stands for, what it did for the rights of students in public schools and colleges but also kind of symbolically for um, if you look at the mentality that it embodies, if you look at the mindset um, that the justices were coming from at that time in 1969, um, it sort of speaks to our, our best selves. It speaks to the, the best and highest duty of the judiciary and what the federal courts have always existed to do. So I think it taps into those larger themes of the importance of the judiciary as kind of this last bulwark to protect less powerful people against more powerful authority figures. You know, one of the things I keep coming back to over and over again with my students, I mean, I'm not a historian, but I always say, you know, you really can't separate these cases from the times in which they were argued. So, you know, that, that, that time, unfortunately for them, is very remote. So let's talk a little bit about the 1960s and about why, why Tinker is, is a case of that time. Right, so what's going on, I mean, the historical backdrop here is the Vietnam War is raging, and it is at that time not, not nearly so unpopular as it becomes in the early 70s, but um, it, it is, there is growing kind of national skepticism about whether it's a good idea to be fighting over there, and, and there is a kind of a strong pacifist movement that's starting to develop, and the Tinker family in Des Moines, Iowa, is a part of this. It's a church-based, religious-based um, pacifism and uh, some of the group of people that engaged in this protest were part of the Quaker uh, tradition and some of them were Methodists. Um, uh, the, the patriarch of the Tinker family was a Methodist pastor um, and two of his kids, uh, Mary Beth and John Tinker, decide that they're gonna engage in this uh, symbolic act of speech by wearing these black armbands to school to show their support for a Christmas troops. Um, uh, uh, Robert F. Kennedy had called for a, uh, uh, the sides in the Vietnam conflict to lay down their arms um, so that they could have a peaceful uh, Christmas together. And uh, in order to show their support for that, the Tinker kids, along with some of their classmates, decide that they're going to wear these black armbands to school. Um, and uh, when they do, they get disciplined by the school. Uh, Mary Beth Tinker gets called into the principal's office and told to remove the armband. And even after she agrees to do that, um, she gets handed a, a, a suspension. And uh, she and her brother John and a couple of their friends are told, um, you're going to have to agree to not wear these anymore or you can't come back to school. Um, and this is what tees up the First Amendment case. And so that's what's going on in, in the country. And what's going on in the court, right, is we've got the Earl Warren court. Um, in the late 60s, and it's kind of, it is the halcyon days of individual liberties, right? I mean, <laughs> Earl Warren and the justices that surrounded him are responsible for a lot of the landmark cases that we take for granted, and frankly, they're starting to erode today, like Tinker is, um, that set the high watermark for criminal defendants' rights, prisoners' rights, and for student rights. And uh, uh, 69 is really like, it's the last hurrah of the Warren <laughs> When they decide this in 69, um, uh, it's kind of, uh, uh, the team starts falling apart after that. Uh, uh, Warren retires, uh, uh, some of the other more liberal justices start retiring, and they get uh, uh, replaced by uh, uh, Nixon appointees, and uh, the court changes direction, and it change, changes culture. Where does Tinker stand today? How strong is it? So Tinker has been kind of nibbled away by exceptions, and the biggest of these is the 1988 Hazelwood case, which comes um, in a very different cultural time for the court. Um, at that time, you've got this sort of a majority on the court that views its role as being deferential to school authorities, to government authorities in general, to police, to prison guards, to prison wardens, and to school administrators. 
years. And so they're coming from such a different place than the 69 uh, Warren Court is coming from. And in Hazelwood, um, uh, the, the speech is not our bands worn on the arm. It is a student newspaper that is subsidized by the school and that has a faculty advisor. And uh, the, the court strikes a very different tone and says, well, in that context, the context of speech that we regard as being sort of an extension of the school curriculum um, that's uh, uh, got the school's name on it, that might reasonably be mistaken by people as uh, carrying the imprimatur of the school, we're going to give the school a free hand to censor. And uh, that newspaper, even though it's produced by students and it's got student bylines and student columns on it and student editors, uh, we really regard that as being almost a mouthpiece for the school. And the school is going to be able to freely censor it as long as they can point to some what the court calls a reasonable pedagogical justification. And, and what's so um, um, disturbing about that formulation is that it is drawn directly from a case that was decided a year earlier in the context of free speech in prisons. Um, mm -hmm. And in the context of free speech in prisons, the court coins this term legitimate penological justification. Um, <laughs> and they just put it in the Xerox machine for public schools and they say, well, just as we said, you know, a legitimate penological justification is enough to justify censorship in prisons, a legitimate pedagogical justification is going to be enough. They even tried to make it rhyme, right? Uh, a legitimate, <laughs> legitimate pedagogical justification is going to be enough in schools. And so the school will always win and the students will always lose. And that's been the experience. And anything that looks like it's this kind of curricular speech, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that's not just newspapers. That's uh, student plays and theatrical performances. Yeah. Increasingly, it's graduation speeches, commencement speeches, mm -hmm. right? Anything that looks like you're not just using your own body like thinkers were, but you're using some kind of a platform that's been supplied by the school, then almost no First Amendment protection is going to apply. Um, and then even the application of Pink, right? Um, a lot of the uh, scholarship will tell you that the courts have been highly deferential at applying the Tinker standard. Uh, the Tinker standard uh, seems, when you read the case, to be very protective of mm -hmm. the student's speech. Absolutely. Right? So it basically says, look, you know, we, we acknowledge that there was some controversy stirred up by these armbands. There were some students that uh, pointed and made comments and that uh, uh, got offended. And, and, and we think uh, we have to pay that price. Uh, mm -hmm. That schools have to be willing to to accommodate a certain amount of vigorous exchange of differing opinions, even on school grounds and even during school time. And if you fast forward to today, right, A, the application of that standard, what uh, what could be shorthanded as the substantial disruption standard, mm -hmm. right? Has Material and substantial, yep. Really deferential and really elastic. Um, and I think, you know, the, the case that comes to mind to me that best exemplifies this was uh, decided about a decade ago now by the uh, Second Circuit in New York. It's the Avery Doninger case. Mm -hmm. um, and it really, I mean, it's a fascinating exercise to put the Avery Doninger decision by the Second Circuit next to the Tinker decision. And you just don't even think you're in the same country. You don't even think that these people are applying the same body of law at all because the Avery Doninger case is about a student who's a student blogger. Right, mm -hmm. and uh, she she goes home and she writes some blog posts where she's trying to incite her fellow students to call and email the school so they can overturn a school policy decision that she disagrees with. Which you know, you and I sort of consider citizen engagement, right? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what we teach kids to do: is you don't like a uh, like something that government is doing, organize, mobilize, get people to to try to change it, and that's what she's engaged in doing. But because she uses some course language in the course of this blog. It's very PG-13 language. It's not anything you, know, you couldn't say on primetime television, but because she uses some course language and referencing the uh, administrators, the court says, well, we think this is unprotected speech. You know, the, 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 the principal had to answer some phone calls and deal with some emails, and that's enough to be a substantial disruption. And so we regard the discipline that was imposed on this blogger to be within the school's authority under Tinker. And I mean, it's just, these are irreconcilable things, right? On the one hand, you've got people wearing the black armbands on school grounds during school time, and it's provoking arguments, it's provoking controversy, and the Supreme Court says, you know what? You gotta let it go. You gotta let the students have their say. Here's a student who's using a blog off campus on her own time, doesn't physically bring the speech onto the campus at all. The Supreme Court says, no, just because she used some uncivil language, we regard that as a punishable disciplinary. So, uh, yeah, that, that gives you an idea of kind of the tenor of the times that we're in versus where we were in 69. Yeah, what's so fascinating to me about that case is I just picture Alexander Mickeljohn just having shivers up and down the spine because that was just 
quintessential political speech, right? It is, I disagree with something that's being done by an authority over me and I'm going to object to it. And so it really, it really was sort of, sort of jaw dropping. And that brings me to the next point that I wanted to talk about. A lot of people now, you know, in the last year, two years, as we've had universities, colleges and universities trying to deal with the question of disrupting other people's speech, um, really use the tinker standard to underpin these kinds of, you know, if you interrupt someone else's speech twice, you can be expelled. And they say that's a material and substantial disruption. Uh, do you buy that? Do you think that tinker provides any safety uh, for kids who would be protesting speech that they don't like on campus? Again, you know, I'm not, I don't, I want, don't want to be seen as, you know, trying to bolster the heckler's veto or anything like that, but it does tinker provide protection for people who, who want to protest counter, um, engage in counter speech on campuses? Yeah, I mean, it's a great unsettled question in the first place, whether tinker is the right place to draw the line in higher ed at all. You okay. Know, the oh, cool. Court has never explicitly said that the tinker level of protection is the right level for adult age people attending college. And you can see where, I think, if you were writing on a blank slate, that you would come up with a more protective standard in college for two reasons. A, the age of the people involved, but also B, that it's not a captive audience, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a decisive difference between K-12 school and college, which is to say, if I'm exposed to speech at college that I find disagreeable, I can leave, right? But if I'm exposed to speech in high school that I don't like, I'm legally required to be there. So if the kid in front of me has a swastika on his t-shirt in algebra class, right? I can't get up and leave algebra class. I'm truant, you know? Right. I'm the wrongdoer at that point. So um, um, it's understandable why the courts might be willing to give a freer hand to prevent or to punish speech in the K-12 setting than they should be in the college setting. So I think as a first uh, principle, we don't really know whether the tinker level, which is, after all, it's a very halfway measure. I mean, it is not the same level of free speech protection that you and I have exactly. standing on a street corner on a Saturday. And it is a training wheels level for sure. You know, the government gets to intervene and stop you if they anticipate, right, reasonably anticipate that your speech is about to cause a substantial disruption, which they could never do to you on a Saturday standing on a street corner. So first of all, I think that Tinker is probably insufficiently protective for higher ed, period, full stop. That being said, a lot of judges will reach into the toolbox and they'll only find Tinker, right? It's like, well, I don't see anything else the Supreme Court has given mm -hmm. me. And so every problem looks like a nail to me because the Supreme Court only gave me a hammer. Uh, so I'll <laughs> go ahead and I'll use Tinker by default. That being said, so could uh, a school or could a college legitimately justify disciplining somebody for you know, an act of, of, of disobedience uh, uh, to a disagreeable speaker? You know, I, I think first going back to the language of Tinker, Tinker talks about class, right? It talks about disrupting the activities of the school. And after all, these students were wearing the armbands in class, during class time. And so I think the, the school's authority is heightened in that setting for sure, right? right? And what you could discipline inside of the class during class time, you probably can't discipline when people are on their own um, doing something voluntary. So, so, you know, I would be hesitant to say that the Tinker level of protection applies in the setting of you know a Richard Spencer coming to campus and giving some kind of pro-Nazi speech where people engage in some counter speech, uh, I, I, would, I would think that some heightened level beyond Tinker should apply. That being said, I haven't seen any court go there, right? I haven't right. seen any court say, well, we're going to coin Tinker Plus uh, or Tinker on steroids um, for higher ed. So I think Tinker may be all there is. And, you know, yeah, constitutionally, I, I do think, right? If you, uh, uh, so I, I, at my university here in Florida, we did have Richard Spencer come in September of 2017, and he did. Um, bring his little band of Nazis to this uh, auditorium. And it was, it, was, it was a very pathetically small showing to show that he really doesn't have any followers at all. Um, but uh, uh, students engaged in very vigorous counter speech where they stood up in mass and they chanted, F you Spencer, F you Spencer, over and over again, only they didn't black it out. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, I do think honestly, like in, in, in an honest application of uh, First Amendment principles, if the school had decided that, you know what, we don't like this guy, but he's got a permit to speak here, and you made it impossible for him to do that. And I kind of do think that the discipline might have been upheld. Now, to the credit of the university, they stayed their hand. Uh, to the credit of the university, stayed hands off. They didn't write anybody up. But could they do that? Yeah, I think constitutionally, they probably could. Yeah. 
One of the interesting things I've always found about Tinker um, is this, this idea of positive and negative conceptions of expression liberty. So, you know, we often, very often think about it as, in terms of, you know, freedom from government. Um, so, you know, it protects me from having the principal sanction my daughter for um, doing the uh, walkout on gun violence a year ago, and she's a high school student. Uh, but I, I think we we often fail to talk about the positive conception of liberty is that this expression gives us the freedom to. So, you know, it gives, it gives principals and teachers the freedom to allow this kind of student protest. You know, one of the Tinker's teachers could say, I don't find, I did not find the armband disruptive. I did, I do not think that this, uh, this hurt our educational environment. So I think it's often we, we think about the, you know, immediate first resort of teachers and particularly the principals is to sanction. But honestly, in this society, do they not have a responsibility to not sanction? I mean, you know, as apart from what, just what the law allows them, do they have a responsibility to encourage that kind of citizenship among their students? I mean, it's a great point, and I do think, you know, again, when you go back, and I really encourage people, dig in there and read that text of the Tinker Opinion. Yep. And it talks about, it uses the phrase hazardous freedom, right? It says it's this kind of hazardous freedom that is the source of our national strength. And so it sort of recognizes that, you know, you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. There are going to be times <laughs> we're going to have some people who are going to have some disagreements and have some hurt feelings. but. That's the price we pay, the court tells us, for living in this disputatious society. And so I think a couple of things, right, have kind of gone off the rails culturally since then. You know, the, the, the mentality when you read cases like Doniger or like the Taylor Bell case out of the Fifth Circuit, which is also an online speech case, mm -hmm. instead of coming from a place that students are citizens in training who have opinions that are worth hearing, Courts are coming instead from a place that, look, our job is to protect the government from the citizens. You know? Our job is to protect the government from these disruptive citizens who might make it harder for the government officials to do their work and to protect other people. So that now, and I really, I mean, I profoundly, profoundly see this in the young people that I talk with and work with, that they kind of perceive the government as this benevolent uh, uh, overlord mm -hmm. that protects them against the irritating other people in their lives who might, you know, uh, post something to social media that they consider to be in bad taste. And then they want to see that, that hammer of discipline brought down on people, right? And, and, and I do think that it's so important for us to go back and to teach those thinker principles and to say, well, wait, wait a second, um, we, 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 we fought a war over this, right? I mean, Multiple. We, we, we overthrew uh, uh, the king so that people could say disagreeable things that other people find offensive. And, mm -hmm. and, and if you don't get that about the Constitution, then you don't get the Constitution. But I really think a lot of our federal judges don't get the Constitution. They just have missed this. It's like, you know, taking your driver's test and you can't turn the ignition key. Uh, I, I, you shouldn't be a federal judge if you don't get this, you know, but, but they don't get that. The fundamental point of having a bill of rights is to protect individual people against overreaching by government regulators and nowhere more so than when people are vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be like prisoners, students, criminal defendants, right? People are at the mercy of powerful government authorities and, and we just lost our, our way there. and. You, know, you will hear a lot of these adult authority figures today say, you know, oh, kids these days, they, they, they just don't understand civics, they don't understand government, they don't value the Constitution, they don't value the person, they don't understand it. And I, when I hear those things, I think of like a, 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 an authority figure with a cigar in both corners of his mouth, like, I don't understand why these kids won't listen to me when I tell them not to smoke, right? And it's like, they won't listen to you because their lived experience is that the Constitution doesn't work. Yeah. Their lived experience is that the government is always right and the citizen is always wrong. And that's what they now experience for the 12 formative years of their life. And so the, the fact that they come out into college and they maybe don't hold the First Amendment in the highest regard is not a surprise. It is exactly what you are teaching them. It is exactly what we're showing kids when we tell them that the government always wins and you always lose. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to me, Frank, one of the things that I've really noticed um, in the last mm, probably 
five years of teaching, maybe seven or eight, um, is that uh, this profound discomfort among my students about the long arm of of the principal that you know really they, maybe not when they're in high school or grade school but when they come to college like why is it that that she could monitor my social media why is it that my friend got suspended for the Instagram photo what why do they get to reach into my life like that so when i if i if i want to find that that nugget of optimism that's where i find it that there's some real critical thinking going on um, you know, in discussions in class that, well, maybe this is a time that we need to, to bite back. So maybe, maybe there's some promise in this generation that, uh, that they'll get back to those constitutional rights and valuing those constitutional rights in the way that you hope that, they, that their, their key is going into the ignition and they're turning it. So I, I'll end with that little dose of optimism. So thank you so much for, for joining me. I really appreciate this. T Tinker is one of my favorite cases. I couldn't agree more that when you dig in and read it, it's just a fascinating, fascinating read. Uh, so thank you so much. I, I, I know this is a crazy time for all of us, but I appreciate you making time today. Oh, thanks for this opportunity, Professor Culver. Really enjoyed it. All right. I'll see you soon, Frank. Bye-bye.